Hey, managerial accounting students. All right, so today we dive into chapter 10, which is really still building on chapters eight and nine, eight being master budgeting. And then in chapter nine, we studied flexible budgets and we were talking about the spending variance. Chapter 10 is gonna take that spending variance and break it down even further, which might seem impossible, but that's what we're doing. Um, during this lecture, I'm going to ask you to solve several problems. So I need you to have out a piece of paper, a pencil, and a calculator, and be ready to solve problems just like we would if we were in class together. I would be writing on the whiteboard plenty, and you guys would be problem solving. So let's get going. So some basic concepts as we get started. As we talk about standards, um, the title of the chapter is Standard Costs and Variances. Um, standards are essentially our norms. So benchmarks are norms for measuring our performance. So in managerial accounting, uh, we typically have two types of standards, the price standards, which are going to specify how much should be paid for each unit of input, and then separately quantity standards, specify how much of an input should be used to make a product or provide a service. I'm going to forewarn you the way that the textbook presents this chapter takes these two very simple concepts of price standards and quantity standards and then proceeds to overcomplicate it. I'm going to continue just to refer to price standards and quantity standards, but the book is going to rename them other things. Um, but I will do my best to keep this concept very simple for you. Um, down here at the bottom, they're referring to some companies that might use benchmarks or norms in their standard costing. Um, so that's all that's about. So the idea is that a company would want to set standards so that they know how much um, their materials, their labor, and even their overhead is going to cost. So they want to have these standards, which are their norms, and then they want to measure to see if they're actually meeting those standards. So when we talk about material standards, we talk about a standard price per unit, which would include the final delivered cost of the materials net of any discounts. And then our standard quantity would be summarized in a bill of materials. That's not a very good definition, but it would be the, um, the quantity allowed um, to produce, I guess, one unit of product. So that would be our standard quantity per unit. Um, then I feel as we go on, we look at our direct labor standards they changed the terminology. So this was a price standard just a moment ago, and now they're referring to it as a standard rate per hour. That's our price of labor. I get it, it's a labor rate, um, but it's still conceptually the same thing that this would be a price. Um, so it's the, a lot of companies will have a combined wage rate that reflects the mix of wages earned by different employees. So your direct labor standard uh, is your standard rate per hour, but I'm going to keep referring to that as a price standard. And then your standard hours, that's the quantity. How many hours? The quantity of time is what they're referring to here. And a manufacturing company might use something like uh, a time and motion study to figure out how much time it should make to produce whatever it is they're producing. And then even when it comes to our variable MO, our variable manufacturing overhead, um, we're also going to have price and quantity standards, which again, sometimes the book refers to as a rate standard. And if it's uh, based on direct labor, often they'll switch this to an hours, standard hours per unit. Um, but I'm still insistent that these are price standards and quantity standards. So the price standard is the rate. The rate is the variable portion of the predetermined overhead rate. And the quantity is the activity in the allocation base for predetermined overhead. So this all has to do with computing the poor and we'll figure out our standard based on that base from computation of the predetermined overhead rate. We will visit that in a little bit. So a standard cost card, whether it's an actual card or it's something in a computer system, doesn't really matter. Um, it's gonna include direct materials, direct labor, and variable MO, which you're pretty used to those three items. And we would specify our standard quantity, or they say hours, still a quantity of time. So standard quantity, our standard price or rate, which again, I'm gonna keep referring to that as a price. 
and then our standard cost per unit. So to make whatever they're making here, it takes three pounds of materials at $4 per pound. So it should cost $12 in materials. For labor, it should take two and a half hours at $14 per hour is $35. And then their variable mo appears to be based on direct labor hours. So 2.5 hours at a variable overhead rate of $3 per hour of $7.50. So it's supposed to cost $54.50 to make each unit of product. So it's important to know that information up front. And then as we go, we're going to compare our actual figures to these standards and figure out our variances and if we need to do anything. So in terms of using these standards and our flexible budgets, as I mentioned earlier, as you recall in chapter nine, we were studying flexible budgets and we had broken down our variances into activity variances and spending variances. And now here in this chapter, we're taking those spending variances and we're making them even more specified and more useful by breaking them down into price and quantity variances. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is drill down and find out why are we missing the mark and what can we do about it? How can we make our company run better? And that comes by seeking detailed information and being able to act on it. And that's what we're doing here in chapter 10. So as we look at our variance analysis, um, our price variance is going to be the difference between the actual price and the standard price. And then our quantity variance will be the difference between the actual quantity and the standard quantity. That seems pretty simple. So as we're looking at our price and quantity standards, um, we want to keep those separate because we want to be able to find out what the cause of the problem is and maybe who might be responsible for it or maybe in a better way uh, who might be able to control it and fix it if we're trying to be constructive. Um, so here they mentioned the purchasing manager is responsible for raw material purchase prices and the production manager is responsible for the quantity of raw material used. So potentially we have two different managers that might be responsible, one for purchasing and therefore the price of the purchase and then the production manager who would be responsible for the amount of material used. And oftentimes buying and using of material could occur at different times. So raw material purchases could be held in inventory for a period of time and then later used in production. So both of those are good reasons why we want to separate our price and quantity standards. So as we go through our variance analysis, um, we said price variance. So we're going to be looking at our materials price variance. They, then say the labor rate variance, which in my mind, I'm still thinking that's my price of labor. So labor rate variance is a price variance. And then our variable overhead rate variance. Um, and again, that's the price of overhead. So all of these are price variances. And then we have our quantity variance. So the materials quantity variance. And then they have the labor efficiency variance. So when we talk about labor efficiency, we're talking about the quantity of hours. Were we able to produce our units of product efficiently within the standard quantity of hours? So again, an efficiency variance is a quantity variance. And then we have variable overhead efficiency variance. Um, oftentimes our variable overhead is going to be tied to our labor. So um, again, when we say an efficiency variance, it's a quantity of hours usually. So all three of these are quantity variances. Um, so you see the terminology that the text is using and they're going to make it seem like we're doing three totally different things as we look at materials and then labor and then variable overhead. But it's really the same thing all the way through. We're going to be looking at price variance and quantity variance. And this will be our general model in computing these variances. So over here on the far left, we're going to take our actual actual. And what that means is our actual quantity of input at the actual price. So the actual quantity times the actual price. And then we're going to comp compare that to the actual quantity at the standard price. So the actual standard. And the difference between those is what we call the price variance. Then over here on the far right, we have the standard standard. The standard quantity allowed for the actual output at the standard price 
And we're going to compare that to the actual standard, and that's going to compute our quantity variance. And combined, that will be our overall spending variance. So as we look at this general model, a couple things to focus in on. They're pointing out a few things here. The actual quantity is the amount of direct materials, direct labor, and variable manufacturing overhead actually used. And then we'd be multiplying that by the standard price. And then on the far right, when they say the standard quantity, just to be clear, that is the standard quantity allowed at the actual level of output for that period. So the standard quantity allowed at the actual level of output times the standard price. And don't worry, we're going to walk through examples to make sure all of this makes sense to you. A few more notes. Actual price is the amount actually paid for the input used. And then standard price is the amount that should have been paid. So the standard, the amount that should have been paid according to our standards for the inputs used. So we're going to go through um, materials, then labor, then variable overhead. Um, looking at this example with Glacier Peak Outfitters. So Glacier Peak Outfitters has the following direct materials standard for the fiber fill in its mountain parka. So they're making parkas like coats, jackets, and they're allowed to have 0.1 kilograms of fiber fill per parka at $5 per kilogram. So that's their standard for materials. And then they tell us, so that's our standards. Here they're going to tell us our actuals. Last month, 210 kilograms of fiber fill were purchased and used to make 2,000 parkas. The materials cost a total of 1,029. Now, before we dive into any higher math, if we made 2,000 parkas, how much fiber fill should we have used according to the standard? We would take 2,000 parkas times 0.1. What do you get? 200, right? And it appears that we used 210. So already we can see that we've used our actual is a different amount than what was allowed to be used by the standard. And then they also give us a total price, a cost. So what we want to do is essentially fill out our variances, organizing it the same way as we looked at in the model earlier, actual, actual on the left, actual standard in the middle, and then standard, standard on the right. So what we have um, they told us 1,029. We could back into these figures here, but our actual actual, they said we spent 1,029. So that goes here under actual actual. Now we could divide that by 210 kilograms and get $4.90 per kilogram. That part's optional, but we've got 1,029. In the middle, we're going to use our actual quantity times our standard price. So the actual quantity was 210 kilograms. We multiply that by the standard price of $5 per kilogram, that comes out to $1,050. And then on the far right, we're looking at our standard standard, the standard quantity. That, so to make 2,000 parkas, the standard quantity allowed at the actual level of output would be 2,000 parkas times 0.1 kilograms is 200 kilograms times $5 per kilogram equals $1,000. So what we see on the far right, we have a standard standard of 1,000. On the far left, we have an actual actual of 1,029. So overall, we have a spending variance of 29U, meaning 29 unfavorable. But what we want to look in more detail at is the price variance versus the quantity variance. So if we break it down, we're comparing $1,000 standard standard versus 1,050 actual standard. So that results in a quantity variance of $50 unfavorable. And really what that represents is the 10 extra kilograms times $5 per kilogram. So we used an extra 10 kilograms times $5 gives us 50 unfavorable. And then over here on the left side, we're comparing our actual actual of 1,029 to our actual standard of 1,050, which is a difference of 21, and that's favorable. We, our actual actual is less than the actual standard, so that was favorable. And what that represents is 210 kilograms times the difference of 10 cents, right? $4.90 per kilogram versus $5 per kilogram. So that's a price variance of 10 cents 
We multiply that by 210 kilograms and we come out with 21 favorable. So big picture, what we're looking at here is uh, a total spending variance of $29 unfavorable, of which the quantity variance is 50 unfavorable and the price variance is 21 favorable. So what happened? We used 10 extra kilograms, but we bought it for only $4.90 instead of $5. So we saved a little bit of money, but then we used too much product. So here they're showing how they got some of these numbers, 200 kilograms. We already talked about this was 0.1 kilograms per parka times 2,000 parkas is 200 kilograms. Over here, they're showing us that they backed into the $4.90 per kilogram. And then here's the part where I think the book way overcomplicates this. They use all these equations. So they're trying to teach you to solve this a different way by memorizing a bunch of equations, I guess, when I think just using the model, the three-prong approach, as I refer to it, I think is a lot more effective and I think it um, helps you get a better understanding of what you're doing. So I don't love this way. If you want to learn it that way, don't let me stop you, but I'm going to keep referring back to this format, the three-prong approach, and you'll see that I will use that throughout the chapter in terms of our problem solving. So who's responsible? What do we do about this? Who is responsible for the materials price variance? And that is the purchasing manager. But who's responsible for the materials quantity variance? And that should be the production manager. The standard price is used to compute the quantity variance so that the production manager is not held responsible for the purchasing manager's performance. But here's the thing, nobody likes to be blamed for anything. I think we have a problem in society that nobody wants to take responsibility for problems. And here we see it again. The materials variances are not always entirely controllable by one person or department. So the production manager may schedule production in such a way that it requires express delivery of raw materials resulting in unfavorable price materials variance. So the purchasing managers can say, hey, it's not my fault production manager, you're not scheduling well enough and it's causing me to have unfavorable materials price variance. That's your fault. And then separately, the purchasing manager may purchase lower quality raw materials resulting in unfavorable materials quantity variance for the production manager. So now the production manager is going to say, hey, it's not my fault. You bought cheap material and we're having to use more of it because it's not good quality. So if we look back at our variances here, Glacier Peak Outfitters, going back to this, here we got cheaper material at $4.90 instead of $5, but we ended up using more of it. So the production manager might say, hey, purchasing manager, not my fault. You bought cheap materials and we couldn't work with them and we ended up using too much and it's your fault. So here we are playing the blame game Standards are set for a reason, um, but if nobody's going to take responsibility, then it makes it hard to problem solve. Ultimately, we need to figure out why did they use an extra 10 kilograms of product? Was it really because it was cheap material? So we'd need to, in a real life situation, get the true answer to that question. So we're going to be looking at Hansen Inc. Uh, we'll be using the same um, example in our quick checks throughout the chapter. This is where I need you to have your pencil, paper, and calculator ready. So we've got Hansen Inc. and they have the following direct material standard to manufacture one zippy. Who knows what a zippy is? I believe it's a close cousin of the widget. So to make a widget is 1.5 pounds of something type of material. We don't even know what it is, but it takes 1.5 pounds of material per zippy at $4 per pound. So that's the standard. Now they're telling us the actual. Last week, 1,700 pounds of material were purchased and used to make 1,000 zippies. The materials cost a total of 6,630. So this info in this paragraph here, that's our actuals. So immediately what I see, we made 1,000 zippies. How many pounds of material should it take to make 1,000 zippies? Mm, it should be 1.5 pounds times 1,000. So that should be 1,500 pounds. 
but they're saying we use 1,700 pounds. Already I can see that we have a, a quantity variance. We use too much, right? And then here, 6,630, that is our actual actual. That's what we actually spent. So what I want you to do on your piece of paper, set up a model like this. So three-prong approach, actual actual on the left, actual standard in the middle, and standard standard on the right. And we want to solve for our price variance, quantity variance, and our overall spending variance. So get that set up, and then we want to start filling in what we know. So what we know is that our actual actual was 6,630. So you can fill in that amount, 6,630 over on the left. And what we do know is that to make 1,000 zippies times 1.5 pounds, that should be 1,500 pounds of material times $4 equals 6,000. So the standard standard is 6,000. So that means the overall spending variance must be 630U, unfavorable. But we need to break that down in more detail into our price variance and quantity variance. So we need to solve for the center section here. Take a moment and fill in the details that you can. All right, so in the middle, you should have 1,700 pounds, meaning our actual quantity, times the standard price, $4, and that equals $6,800 total. Over here on the left, I filled in a little more detail that 6,630, that is the dollar amount, but it breaks down to 1,700 pounds, the actual quantity, at $3.90 per pound. So our price actually came in under, the standard was four, um, but we used too much material, right? So if we work out our math here, we've got 6,000 is our standard standard, and we're comparing that to 6,800, and that's 800U, unfavorable. So that can be explained by the extra 200 pounds times $4. And then for our price variance, we're comparing that $6,800, the actual standard, versus 6,630. So both we're taking our actual quantity of 1,700 pounds, but here we're multiplying it by our standard price of $4, and here we're multiplying it by our actual price of $3.90, which is the difference of 10 cents per pound. So if we take 1,700 times 10 cents per pound, that's our uh, price variance of 170 favorable. So we have a favorable price variance because our price is only $3.90 instead of four, but we have an a 800 unfavorable quantity variance because we use 200 pounds too much of material. And if we take 800 U and 170 F combined, that is 630 U. Remember, think of unfavorable or U as negative and F or favorable as positive numbers. So we pretty much already worked out the whole problem. Um, that's what I need you to be capable of doing this chapter is reading that material and, or excuse me, reading that information um, and then filling out this so that you can then answer questions. So the questions that they're gonna ask you, how many pounds of materials should Hansen have used to make a thousand zippies? Well, according to the standard, it's gonna be a thousand zippies times 1.5 pounds per zippy is B, 1500. So then they want to know, what is our materials quantity variance? Well, we could go back to our work that we already did. Our materials quantity variance, that'll be our quantity variance over here, was 800U, which is 200 pounds times $4. So given our answer choices, I think it looks like C. So they're using the equation method to show their answers, but we already figured this out using the three-prong approach. Then the next question, what is the materials price variance? And again, we can go back to our work that we did. Our price variance was 170F, which was explained by 1,700 pounds times 10 cents difference per pound. And there we go. What is materials price variance? It was B, 170 favorable. And again, they're showing this using their complicated equation me method but we already solved all of that when we laid it out using the three-prong approach. 
Here they show the solution to the problem in a format more similar to what we did. Those are the same numbers we came up with. Here they're reminding us that the standard quantity for a thousand zippies is 1,000 zippies times 1.5 pounds. So it's the standard allowed for the actual quantity. So an actual quantity of 1,000 zippies, so that's 1,500 pounds. So that's materials. Next, we're going to take a look at labor. We're going to look at our labor rate variance, which is a price variance, and our labor efficiency variance, which is our quantity variance. So we're back to Glacier Peak Outfitters. And they have the following direct labor standards for the mountain parka. 1.2 standard hours per parka at $10 per hour. So that's our standards. Then they're telling us the actuals down here. Last month, employees actually worked 2,500 hours at a total labor cost of 26,250 to make 2,000 parkas. So before we proceed, let's pause for a second. 2,000 parkas. How many hours should we have worked to produce 2,000 parkas? If we take 2,000 times 1.2 standard hours, what does that equal? Mm, that should be 2,400 hours. And they're telling us we actually worked 2,500 hours. So already, before we even do any math here, I can see that we spent 100 hours too much. So I can already see that we're going to have a problem here. So here we've laid out all the data. On the far left, we have our actual actual, which they revealed to us is 26,250. And we could break that down. It was 2,500 actual hours. And if we take 26,250 divided by 2,500 hours, we get $10.50 per hour. On the far right, we know that, it was, that the standard would be 2,400 hours, 1.2 hours per parka times 2,000 times $10 per hour is our $24,000. And then in the middle, we're looking at our actual hours at the standard rate. So 2,500 actual hours times $10 per hour standard is 25,000. So big picture, if I compare our standard standard to our actual actual, we have a big unfavorable, right? 2,250 unfavorable, but we need to further break it down into our price, and quantity variances, which again, they refer to as rate and efficiency variances. That's fine. We're going to keep using the same model though. Um, so this, our rate variance is our price variance. So we're comparing our actual, actual 26,250 to our actual standard. So how much should we have paid for 2,500 hours of labor? I mean, we should have paid 25,000, but we actually paid 26,250. So we have a labor rate variance of 1250 unfavorable. And in terms of our efficiency variance, we're comparing $24,000 versus $25,000. And our efficiency variance is 1000 unfavorable, which is explained by 100 extra hours times $10 per hour. Here they're just pointing out to compute the $10.50 per hour, which you didn't have to do. Um, but sometimes it's useful information. We're just taking the 26,250 and dividing it by 2,500 hours, and we come up with $10.50 per hour. Sometimes that's useful to see that our rate here was higher than the $10 per hour standard. So sometimes it's insightful information. Now they're showing us this equation method again, and they've changed all the equations and used all these different letters when really it's the same equations as before. We're doing the same thing. And so again, I think this unnecessarily complicates what we're doing here. And I encourage you to continue using the three-prong approach. Um, but if you love the equations and you like memorizing gobbledygook, uh, don't let me stop you. When we think about responsibility for labor variances, production managers are usually held accountable for labor variances because they are supposed to influence these key factors the mix of skill levels assigned to work tasks, the level of employee motivation, the quality of production supervision, and the quality of training uh, provided to employees. So production managers should be influential and responsible for all of these things, but there's always the blame game, right? 
the labor variances are not always entirely controllable by one person or department. For example, hmm, the maintenance department manager may do a poor job of maintaining production equipment. This may increase the processing time required per unit, thereby causing an unfair favorable labor efficiency variance. Then they also suggest the purchasing manager may purchase lower quality raw materials, resulting in unfavorable labor efficiency variance for the production manager. You know what I see here? I see the production manager blaming the purchasing manager, the purchasing manager blaming the production manager, and then ultimately they all just point at the maintenance manager and essentially they're blaming the janitor. You did a poor job of maintaining the machines and that's why everything's taking so long. It's your fault. Um, in a real business, we would need to get down to the bottom of this and find out what's going on. Um, just the finger pointing isn't going to help us improve our company. And remember, the whole reason for doing this and looking at our standards and analyzing these variances is to improve our company's overall performance. Um, it's not about pointing fingers and blaming. It's about a process of improvement and continually seeking improvement at our company. So this blame game isn't going to get us anywhere. We need to actually solve some problems here. Let's keep going. So it's our turn again. Quick check number two. So now we're back at Hanson Inc. manufacturing zippies. And this time we need to figure out our labor variances. So to manufacture one zippy, it's 1.5 standard hours per zippy at $12 per direct labor hour. Last week, 1,550 direct labor hours were worked at a total labor cost of 18,910 to make 1,000 zippies. Okay, so let's hold on here a second. If we're making 1,000 zippies, how many hours should that take? 1,000 times 1.5 standard hours, that should take 1,500 hours, but we spent 1,550. So already I can see that we use too many hours. So why don't you take a moment and fill out this on your piece of paper, our three-pronged approach, actual, actual, actual standard, standard, standard. So go ahead and fill this out on your piece of paper, set this all up and start filling in the numbers that you know. So here's that data again. And feel free to hit pause and do some problem solving. And then when you're ready, let's get back to it. All right, so the question, Hansen's labor rate variance for the week was, hmm, did you fill out your three prongs? What is the labor rate variance comparing? So the rate variance is the price variance. So labor rate variance is this price variance here. So what was our actual actual? And what was the actual standard? It's 1550 hours, 1550 times $12. That was our actual standard, right? And what was the actual actual? Well, that was provided to us in the information. It was 18,910. So you should have come up with A, 310 unfavorable. So we're comparing 1,550 hours, one at $12.20 per hour and one at $12 per hour. Then they wanna know what was our labor efficiency variance? And when they say labor efficiency variance, they're referring to our quantity variance, the quantity of hours used determines our efficiency. So here we're comparing our standard standard times our actual standard. Well, we already computed our actual standard, right? 1550 times $12. And what would our standard standard be? It would be 1500 hours times $12, right? So what did you get for your labor efficiency variance? You should have come up with C, 600 unfavorable. So it's the extra 50 hours times $12 is 600 unfavorable. So big picture, here's what we're looking at. Hopefully what you wrote out on your piece of paper looks something like this. 
Over here on the far left, they provided our actual actual was 18,910. If you want to break that down, that's 1,550 hours times $12.20 per hour. So you can get the 1220 by taking 18,910 divided by 1550 and you're backing into the $12.20 per hour. Again, you don't have to come up with that bit of information, but it might be useful to see that your hourly rate exceeds the $12 per hour standard. On the far right, our standard standard is 1,500 hours, which is 1,000 zippies times 1.5 hours. And then multiply that by our standard rate of $12 per hour. That equals 18,000. So big picture, comparing far right and far left, we have 910 unfavorable. And we need to know how much is our price variance and how much is our quantity variance. So if we throw in the middle our actual hours of 1,550 hours at the standard rate of $12 per hour, we get 18,600. Now we can compute our price or labor rate variance, which is 310 unfavorable, which again we can explain by taking 1550 times the extra 20 cents. Okay, so 1550 hours times an extra 20 cents per hour, that gives us 310 unfavorable. And then in terms of our uh, efficiency or our quantity variance, we're taking the extra 50 hours, the difference between 1550 and 1500, the extra 50 hours times $12 per hour, and mathematically we get our difference of 600 unfavorable. And all combined, that looks like 910 unfavorable. So mathematically, this all has to check out that the sum of our uh, price variance and our quantity variance have to add up to the total variance when we lay all this out. So finally, we're going to do this all again for our variable overhead rate and efficiency variances. So we're looking at our variable low, and they say rate and efficiency. And again, that's our price and our quantity variance. Um, same idea conceptually. So again, we're back at Glacier Peak Outfitters, and they use direct labor hours as the allocation base for their predetermined overhead rate. And the company has the following standard variable mo cost for each mountain parka, 1.2 standard labor hours. So of course that matches our labor standard at $4 per labor hour. And this info should look familiar because it's being driven by labor hours and we just previously did our labor standards. So last month employees actually worked 2,500 labor hours to make 2,000 parkas actual variable mo for the month was 10,500. So again, if we're making 2,000 parkas, how many hours should we have spent? 2,000 times 1.2 is 24,000, excuse me, 2,400 hours, and we actually work 2,500 hours. So we have an extra 100 hours in there again. Same as our labor, right? So if we fill this out, we set this up using the three-prong approach. That's what we just talked about. We've got 2,400 hours standard times $4 is 9,600. But our actual actual is 2,500 hours for a total of 10,500. If we take 10,500 divided by 2,500 hours, we get $4.20. So we can see our $4.20 per hour is greater than the standard of $4 per hour. And then in the middle, we have our actual hours of 2,500 times our standard rate of $4. So in all of these, we do our math. On the far right, the standard standard should be 9,600. That's what we should have spent on variable mo. But our actual actual is 10,500. So overall, we're looking at 900 U, 900 unfavorable. And again, we have to break it down into our price and quantity variances or rate and efficiency variances. So we're comparing 9,600 standard standard to 10,000 actual standard. We get a difference of 400 unfavorable. And again, we could reconcile that. That's 100 hours times $4 per hour. So that's creating a $400 difference. And then we compare our actual standard, 10,000, to our actual actual, 10,500. And we come up with 500 unfavorable which we could reconcile that taking 2,500 hours times a difference of 20 cents per hour, and that would give you 500 unfavorable.
So here they're just showing some of the math. And again, they give you these equations in case you want to memorize a bunch of letters and equations, and they've rewritten them with different letters as if it's something totally new and different. But it's not. It's the same thing. It's that same three-prong approach, looking at our price and quantity variances that they conveniently rename every time we look at it. Um, and again, if you want to memorize this, don't let me stop you, but I really encourage you to keep coming back to uh, the three-prong approach. So again, quick check, we're back at Hanson Inc. dealing with our zippies, and we have a manufacturing overhead standard of 1.5 standard labor hours per zippy at $3 per direct labor hour. So again, our variable mo is driven by labor hours. So we're going to see some, some familiar numbers here. Last week, 1,550 labor hours were worked to make 1,000 zippies, and our actual, actual uh, $5,115 was spent for variable mo. Okay, so again, I want you to go ahead and fill this out into the three-prong approach. Lay it out like this on your sheet of paper. Actual, actual on the left, actual standard in the middle, standard, standard on the right. So draw that out and then try to fill in as much of this information as you can. So things to note. You're making a thousand zippies, and that should be times 1.5 standard labor hours, so our standard hours should be 1,500, and again, we worked 1,550. So on the far right, your standard standard is going to be 1,500 labor hours times $3 per labor hour. That's our standard. But in the middle, we're going to take actual hours, 1,550 labor hours, times our standard price of $3 per direct labor hour. And then on the far left, under actual, actual, it's going to be 5,115. And we can break it down or not, but that's our actual, actual. So you've sketched this out. You've filled out as much information as you can. Let's see if we can answer their questions. So Hansen's rate variance, that's our price variance, their rate variance, their variable manufacturing overhead rate variance for variable mo for the week was, hmm, what did you come up with? So we're comparing 5,115 to what did you get in the middle? be 1550 times three, which is 4650, right? So you should come up with 465 unfavorable. So 1550 hours, and you're multiplying that by a rate difference of 30 cents, and you get 465 unfavorable. We're comparing 5,115 actual actual to 4650 actual standard. How about this one? What is Hansen's efficiency variance? Their variable manufacturing overhead efficiency variance. So now we're comparing on the right, this is our quantity variance. We're comparing our actual, uh, actual standard from the middle to our standard standard on the far right. So in the middle, we already computed, we've got 1550 times $3, that should be 4650. And then on the far right, we should have 1500 times three, $3 per hour should be 4500. So I'm hoping you came up with 150 unfavorable. So the extra 50 hours times $3, and that's 150 unfavorable. Overall, I'm hoping what you drew out looks something like this. Their format's a little bit different, but still the same three-prong approach. So on the far right, we have our standard standard, 1,500 hours times three is 4,500. In the middle, we actually took 1,550 hours times $3 per hour is 4,650. And on the far left, the actual actual is provided to us 5,115. And then if we want, we can back into $3.30 per hour by taking 5,115 divided by 1,550 hours and you can compute the $3.30 per hour. So that's how we know it's an extra 30 cents per hour. 
So big picture, comparing 4,500 to 5,115, we have a total spending variance of $615, but we explain it in more detail by looking at our price or our rate variance, 465U, and our quantity or our efficiency variance of 150U. So here's an important little note, an important subtlety. So English language is so weird. How does that say subtlety? But there it is, subtlety. The quantity variance is computed only on the quantity used, while the price variance is computed on the entire quantity purchased. So earlier when we did our uh, practice problems for materials, both of them, we purchased and used all of the material but that's not always reality. So please watch for this in your homework. Um, I believe you do have one homework problem where you purchase one amount of material and then you use a different amount of material. So how will you deal with that? Well, here's an example. And if you get stuck on your homework, refer back to this example, it's a good one. So we're back at Glacier Peak Outfitters and they have the following direct material standards. So this is old news, we heard about this before, 0.1 kilograms of fiber fill per parka at $5 per kilogram. And they say last month, 210 kilograms of fiber fill were purchased at a cost of $1,029, but they used 200 kilograms to make 2,000 parkas. So we purchased 210, but we used 200. So what that means is in the middle, as we lay out our three-prong approach, we have to do our actual twice, our actual quantity purchased and our actual quantity used. So as we compute our quantity variance over here, the actual quantity used is 200 kilograms. So we don't have any quantity variance. We used exactly what the standard called for, 200. But over here, we take our actual quantity purchased and we do that at the actual price and the standard price and we end up with a price variance of 21 favorable because we purchased it for apparently $4.90 per pound. We get that by taking 1,029 divided by 210 is $4.90 per pound. So we're computing these separately. What we're doing is computing the center section, the actual standard, we're computing it two different ways. The actual quantity used times the standard price and the actual quantity purchased times the standard price. So look at this layout here and use that as you work your homework problem that has this difference, the difference between the quantity purchased and the quantity used. So do pay attention to that and refer back to this slide. So in terms of our standard costs and our uh, use of this type of system, there's definitely some advantages. Standard costs are a key element of the management by exception approach, meaning that we want to look into any variances, whether we're over or under. Is it good to buy cheap material? Well, it's good if it's still good quality. We always like to get a good price, but we need to make sure that our materials meet our standards. So anytime there's a variance, whether it's over or under, whether it's a price variance or a quantity variance, management should want to look into it. Standards exist for a reason. Standards can provide benchmarks that promote economy and efficiency, but they can also help promote quality products by not trying to go too cheap. Standards can support responsibility accounting systems. When we say responsibility accounting systems, remember that's a nice way of saying, uh, who do we blame for this? And again, blame has a very negative connotation, but when we say blame, we want to get down to the bottom of it. What's, what's causing this variance and what are we going to do about it? Um, so that's what responsibility accounting is all about. Not necessarily punishing somebody, but getting some answers and finding out what we should do. And then finally, this one's kind of interesting to me. They say standards can greatly simplify bookkeeping. What do they mean by that? Well, here's the thing. Some companies that choose to use standard costs will record all of their production throughout the year using their standard costs rather than their actuals, and then they'll true it up once with an adjustment at the end of the period. So in terms of our bookkeeping, 
Um, it could be simplified. Um, some companies have a capacity to use their standard costing in their bookkeeping, and that is in some ways easier than keeping track of the actuals each week or each month or each quarter, however they do it. And then at the end of the year, they make one adjustment to true everything up. So that's the idea that they're going after here. Um, you're probably thinking, none of this seems simple. This doesn't seem like it's simplifying our bookkeeping, but um, they do have an interesting point there. Potential problems. Um, do note that they're gonna give you two slides of potential problems. So do these potential problems outweigh the advantages? Nah, hard to say. Standard cost variance reports are usually prepared on a monthly basis and may contain information that is outdated. Mm, I think that's kind of a silly problem. Just prepare the reports faster. Stop complaining and work faster. Um, so that would be a quick solution to that problem. But even if we're looking at our standard reports from last month, I still want to know what the problem was and see if we can do better. Um, next, if variances are misused as a club to negatively reinforce employees, morale may suffer and employees may make dysfunctional decisions. So this is where they're talking about the blame game. If we're going to use these variances to essentially punish employees, to punish managers, um, that's not really the right way to run our company for efficiency and improve our our um, overall performance. We really do want to use responsibility accounting and find out what the problem is, and most importantly, how to solve the problem by getting in touch with the right managers. That doesn't mean that we have to punish them or uh, club them. I think that's a pretty harsh word that they're using here. So it seems like some of these potential problems could be overcome by a thoughtful manager. Um, down here at the bottom, labor variances assume that the production process is labor paced and that labor is a variable cost. These assumptions are often invalid in today's automated manufacturing environment where employees are essentially a fixed cost. Well, yeah, there's some truth to that. So maybe we don't worry about our labor variances too much and we focus more on our materials variances. So more potential problems. Just meeting standards may not be sufficient. Continuous improvement may be necessary to survive in a competitive environment. Um, again, if our standards aren't driving that continuous improvement, then management's not doing a great job setting those standards. Um, and again, that is a potential problem, but it can be overcome by competent management. Um, next over here on the right, in some cases, a favorable variance can be as bad or worse than an unfavorable variance, right? So like if we talked about our materials quantity variance and they say, oh, we saved a ton on our materials this month. We only put half the amount of fiber fill into the parkas and therefore we have this uh, favorable materials quantity variance. Is that really what the company wants? So now we're making low quality parkas that aren't as warm and high quality as what our customers were expecting. Uh, that's not a good thing. The standards exist for a reason. So we don't necessarily want to um, short our products on material. Um, and again, also having lower prices. If it means lower quality materials, that could be a problem as well. So um, we do need to make sure we understand that favorable variances are potentially as bad than unfavorable variances, that the standards exist for a reason. And then lastly, excessive emphasis on meeting the standards may overshadow other important objectives such as maintaining and improving quality, on-time delivery, and customer satisfaction. And again, this is another problem. All of these problems, I think, can be overcome by good, competent management. Um, anytime we get too focused on any one metric, we can lose sight of another. So um, agreed, excessive emphasis on standards could distract us from other important things. So we need to make sure that we are considering all of the factors that affect the performance of our company and that standards are just one of them. So that's it, guys. That's the whole chapter on standards. Um, I really encourage you to keep coming back to this. This general model, what I refer to as the three-prong approach with actual, actual on the left, actual standard in the middle, and standard, standard on the right, and use that in your problem solving, whether it's for materials, labor, or variable overhead, the same format can be used 
to problem solve. So, um, of course, let me know if you guys have any questions or need any help on the chapter material. Good luck.